Okay, we're <clears throat> I finished with our studies of the Sermon on the Mount. We've now uh, gone to the book of the Revelation. We're going to spend quite some time, I'm sure, here in the book of the Revelation. And we actually started last week, and uh, I spoke primarily about the fact that the Bible is a prophetic book, and this is the closing prophecy that we find in the canon of Scripture. These are the, the final thoughts that the Lord wanted to leave the church. It's very important for us to realize that the entire book of the Revelation was written to the seven churches. And so we are a church. And so it's, this is very personal. This is a personal letter uh, to the churches. We have the advantage of reading the, the message that the Lord sent to uh, the seven churches that were in Asia. And so that's advantageous to us. Uh, the Lord did address the specific problems that existed in the various local churches in Asia. And so the letters were uh, tailored to fit the situation there in the churches. But I have no doubt that uh, even though it was tailored to fit the needs at that time in the churches. It's certainly a message that is very relevant to um, all the churches um, throughout the church age. And so we'll be looking at those uh, in particular a little bit later. But the focus right now is the importance of Bible prophecy uh, what I'm trying to do in these messages and in, in a lot of my, my teaching is to give us um, <clears throat> sort of a big picture view of the way God sees things. And I think if we could get a handle on that, then as we work on down into the details, it'll make more sense to us. And so I wanted to um, say a few things about Bible prophecy. Um, <clears throat> I was speaking to you last week, and I want to touch on some of these things briefly. That um, Bible prophecy is the greatest evidence, with emphasis on the word evidence, available to the human mind of the the truth of what's said in this book. And the reason is because Bible prophecy uh, has to do with the thoughts of the invisible God out of that invisible dimension, but he's speaking about things that are going to happen in the visible dimension, in the physical world right where we live. And so anytime you're talking about events, you're talking about Reality. You're talking about reality as the human mind knows reality to be. Uh, we have made some mention of the despair of the philosophers because there is no way that the human mind can investigate an invisible dimension. We don't have the tools to know God. Uh, our minds are just not geared to even think in terms of a a world where there is no space, time, and matter. And so we are earthlings, and the only way our mind works is in terms of the world of existing things. And so that's why uh, God came out of that invisible dimension and came into the visible dimension and proved himself to be the invisible God. But he had to come into the visible world to do that. And so when Paul, when uh, Peter rather, is talking about uh, being an eyewitness uh, of the majesty of the Lord Jesus when he was transfigured on the holy mount, 
he goes on to say something that is very important to uh, people that will never be privileged to see what the disciples saw and what that generation saw of the miraculous things that Jesus did uh, and the things that pertain to him to, to have actually been there as eyewitnesses. And he said, you got something better. You have a more sure word of prophecy. A more sure word of prophecy. Now, every indication from that language is that the Bible itself, the prophetic nature of the Bible itself, is more certain than having been there to see Jesus Christ with your eyes. To see the things that he did with your eyes. Um, and so we've got a whole book here full of prophecy. Uh, many of them have already been fulfilled. And some of them are uh, being fulfilled. And some of them are uh, in the future and will be fulfilled. But the fact that they're going to occur as it's written, as it's predicted in Scripture, is the evidence for the faith. And, and again, I, I think the reason this is so important to emphasize to the point that it, it, it's an involuntary knowledge to us. I mean, when we're out witnessing to people, it's just right there. It's available to us. We can throw it out there and use it. It's because we're living in a generation that has been deceived by the strategy of Satan uh, in convincing people that there is no evidence for the Christian faith and that faith doesn't have anything to do with evidence. Yes, it does. It has everything to do with evidence. And so this is what we've been trying to establish is that the Christian faith is is about the truth and truth has evidence and a lie doesn't. And so uh, when we study the Bible, we see that, that evidence is all over the place. Uh, when Luke uh, spoke to Theophilus about the many infallible proofs, uh, this is what he was referring to. Uh, it's infallible evidence, infallible proof and evidence, facts, things that actually occurred in space and time. Well, when things actually occur in space and time, it cannot be refuted because it occurred. And there's no evidence that it didn't occur. Uh, so this is uh, tremendously important. Uh, Another thing that I want to mention briefly is that the evidence is not the primary focus of faith, but rather the, the person the faith is invested in. Uh, it's very important to understand that because otherwise we get into nothing but intellectualism um, the studying of prophecy and the particulars, and we get to focusing on the particulars to the point that we can't even see uh, the forest for the trees. We, we miss the point. We do not see the big picture of why the Lord has provided the evidence. The evidence is so that we might believe him, trust him, have faith in him. And n neither of these things, believing, faith, or trust, is possible without a reason. You have to have a reason. And it has to be a real reason. Something that you can identify with. Something that you have uh, personal acquaintance with in terms of the, the person this faith is invested in. Now, there are just a number of things in Scripture that the devil uses to try to trip us up. And this past Wednesday night, uh, I think that's right. Didn't I speak Wednesday night? I think that's right. <laughs> I get confused. Uh, um, I spoke about um, 
some of the troublesome verses that we run into in the Bible that tend to cause us to doubt. Um, the devil gets inside our minds and and tries to make us uh, doubt the person of Christ and the integrity of this book because of what seems to be uh, contradictions or things that are not logical because it does not um, fit our system of logic as we typically perceive things. And uh, so I tried to pick out a few things uh, uh, in that message that uh, can be sources of, of trouble for people, uh, sources to cause doubt, and the devil tries to do things like that. And, and one of the leading thoughts was taken right here from Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. If you'll read with me, we'll read that first verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified, signified it by his angel unto his servant John. I was pointing out to you that it's important to pay attention to the word him. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. And we need to properly identify him. What him? Uh, is this referring to John? Well, many read this and think that it's referring to John. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, that is John, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Well, that's not, I don't think, the correct way to read it. The correct way to read it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, speaking of Jesus Christ. And that becomes problematic to people. Uh, in the same way that there are numbers of other verses uh, in the Bible that seem to indicate that Jesus Christ is less than the Father in some way and is therefore not equal to God. And I was talking about how a lot of cults are based on verses like this that seem to be obscure because we're trying to put upon the words human logic the way we typically perceive things to be. And it appears to be contradictory. It appears to run counter to um, what we maybe have been taught about the person of Christ, that he is God. And so how can he be God and need to be revealed to by the Father? But there are other verses that reinforce this doctrine in Scripture, uh, such as the one where the Lord Jesus is saying, my Father is greater than I am. Or the one in, in Mark chapter 13 in verse 32 that says, But of that day knoweth no man, no not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. And so here is a, a verse that's problematic to people because it just, just doesn't seem to fit our system of logic as we perceive things. And we've been taught that Jesus Christ is God, that he's... Um, he has the attributes of God, and one of the attributes of God is omniscience. He knows all things. So how could he know all things and not know all things? And the indication is here he doesn't know all things. And so we tried to look into that. And one of the major points I was making in that message is that God did not put those things in there to trip us up and to confuse us. He actually put those things in there to clarify the revelation of himself so that we might understand him better. And if you do not understand it that way, if you do not see it that way, then you got a real burden because uh, this whole book, the design of the entire revelation from cover to cover is to the end that we might know him. 
Now, when his identity is so important in his mind for the people of this world that we might see him as he is and know him, um, how can it be logical that he would sprinkle in a few things here and there to trip us up and get us confused as to his identity? Especially when your eternal soul rests upon an accurate knowledge of his identity. The Apostle John said, If any man believe not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, he's not of God. Um, you know, we, we learned in the um, uh, Sermon on the Mount that there would be many in that day that thought they knew God who at the last would hear the Lord say, Depart from me, ye that work, it in, work iniquity, for I never knew you. I never knew you. In other words, you didn't have a personal relationship with me, and you didn't know me. And that's essentially what that's saying. And so we, what we have to do is divorce human logic as we've ever used it. And what we need to do is, 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 is receive, as the Apostle Paul encourages us to do, let that mind be in us, that's also in Christ Jesus, so that we might see these things through the logic of God. And there's a difference. There's the logic of God. And there's the logic of man. And, and that's, you see, that's our problem. We're, we're earthly. We're worldly. And, and our, our, our minds, we're finite, and we're not capable of understanding eternal things. The philosophers prove that. And this is the whole significance of the revelation, is because we can't think God's thoughts after him unless he gives us his thoughts. And so what we have to do is is look into this state, these statements and understand first and foremost that God is not a deceiver. He is the truth. And it's critical that we get the details of this revelation of himself correct because if you're wrong in your perception of the Lord, then you don't know him. And to not know him is to be lost. And that is, that is contrary to the reason that he came into the world, to die for us to the end we might be saved. He gives us his Holy Spirit that we might get the message right. Because a natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Because they're spiritually discerned, okay? If we have that message in the Bible that they're spiritually discerned, then isn't that telling us that we cannot understand it with human logic? And that's exactly what it's telling us. We have to have the logic of God. And when we have the logic of God, it makes all sense in the world. Now, the natural man puts a premium on quantity of knowledge. The more you know, the more degrees you can hang on your wall and you can be proud. You know, I've read ever so many hundreds and thousands of books and I finished this course, this course, this course, and I've got all these degrees and I'm very proud of all that I know. Well, when you study... Um, Ezekiel 28, you find out that this was the root of the sin of Lucifer and what ultimately caused his fall. He was corrupted by reason of his brightness, and so is man, because we are just like him in our nature. There is no difference whatsoever in the nature of man and the nature of Satan when you study what the book has to say about it. And so man, by nature, is very proud of what he knows. And so all of a sudden we're seeing 
uh, in the Trinity, as we study the Trinity, that there's one of the persons of the Trinity that doesn't know certain things as compared to the Father. And it's there in the language whether we want to believe that or not. And again, that defies logic as we typically apply it, apply it, but not the logic of God. It makes all sense in the world. Now, now here's the ultimate lesson of the Trinity. You see, the total purpose of the book of the Revelation is that God wants us to be one with him as he is one with the Father. That's the total plan of God, is to make us one with himself. You see this in John chapter 17. To make us one with himself in exactly the same way that he is one with the Father. So the plan of God was to enlarge his family, and the family is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He wanted to enlarge his family so that we would be in his image, so that we would be like him. And we will be like him. When God is through with us, when he is through with his program, we will be like him. And the ultimate goal is that we be one with him with no division whatsoever. So unity and division are opposites. But what we find is that intellectualism causes division. It resulted in the fall of Lucifer. It resulted in the rebellion of the third of the angels that fell with him. So what is the Lord teaching us here by having us study the persons of the Trinity? Well, he's teaching us that quantity of knowledge is not essential to unity. Not when you love the persons of the Trinity. Not when you have reasons to love the persons of the Trinity. And there was a quality of knowledge that Jesus Christ had of the Father that he loved him. And the elements that man by nature craves to have, which is knowledge and power. You go back and read John's Gospel about the fifth chapter where Jesus Christ says, All power has been given unto me. That word given is very important. It suggests that he didn't have it. Well, did he, have to have, did he have to have it to be equal with the Father? And the answer is absolutely not. And what we see in our study of the Trinity is the, is the, uh, the selflessness of the persons of the Trinity and the humility of the persons of the Trinity. And... In that message Wednesday night, I tried to point out the verses that teach very clearly the humility of the Holy Spirit. Um, when he said, when it says, he shall not speak of himself, but he shall glorify me. He shall glorify me. The Holy Spirit is a humble person. And his work in this world is not to glorify himself, but to glorify Christ. And so... This is the attitude of each of the persons of the, the Trinity is to glorify the other. There's no self-centeredness whatsoever in the Trinity. And so why would the Lord reveal himself to us to be that way? Because he's going to conform us into the same image. And if we're going to be one with him, then we better understand something about knowledge. That knowledge puffeth up. And you do not see puffed up persons in the Trinity, in there. And you do not see a competition in power 
Because here is the Son of God, and I know that it is typically taught, you know, this is Christ in his humanity. He came as man, and, and he's a, you know, a picture of the way we should be. Folks, it's deeper than that. These things are true statements about the actual relationship of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. These are not just little, you know, parable illustrations to help us have a better relationship with the Lord. This is a revelation of the persons of the Trinity. And, uh, and this is the logic of God. He's contemplating himself and he's revealing it to us as he is. And what we learn about the Son of God is his humility when it came to knowledge. And it didn't interfere with his relationship with the Father or the Holy Spirit in any respect whatsoever that there were things he did not know. I did point out to you, and I think it's a, it's a, a point that's very important in this regard, is that this does not distract from deity and the powers of deity to will to not know something because the point is there's no one in the universe that can will to not know something but God. Now, we cannot will to not know something that we know. You have to be God to do that. And so we don't want to fall into the humanistic logic of saying, okay, can God create a rock so big he can't pick it up? And so therefore, according to that logic, there's things God can't do. Well, that's the foolishness of man. That's why we need the, the aid of the Holy Spirit to understand how God is using his logic and what he's trying to teach us about himself. And I'm telling you that when you look into it, you'll find that Jesus Christ not knowing certain things glorifies him even more because only God could be omniscient and will to not know things. And then we looked at the personal reason that's important. It's because there's going to come a day in the future that all three of the persons of the Trinity will will to not know anymore or remember your sin. Can God do that in truth? And the answer is absolutely. He can put away your sin and by an act of the will of his own mind because he is God, he can say, I will not remember your sin anymore. And it'd be a true statement. Now, that's why it's important to look into these things and think through these thoughts because there are people out here in the world who will try to use human logic and the strategy of Satan, who has fallen, to try to trip us up over these things that on the surface appear to be an absolute contradiction. And I'm telling you, they're not. They're not contradictions at all. So, um, what we learn about the Trinity is that there is a rank there. And that rank is brought out all over the place. There's the Father, and there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit, and that's the rank. And we find that there's rank in the world, and it's very important. To understand there's rank in our homes, there's rank in government, there's rank in our, all of our institutions, <coughs> and without the rank, uh, things do not go very well. You have to have it. But rank is not to be confused with equality in terms of role. 
or equality in terms of essence. For instance, the essence of a husband and wife is the same. And the role of a husband and a wife are equal in terms of the importance of the role of each. They're equal. But the rank is different for a purpose. And we find the same thing in the Trinity. Okay, so let's leave all of that behind. That's just sort of a, uh, a maybe a jump start into the revelation to hopefully have that in the backdrop of our thinking as we read through and study these things. Uh, and let's go to verse 1 once again. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So the question may arise, um, okay, uh, the Lord Jesus very specifically and emphatically said when it came to the question of his, his second coming, the disciples asked him that in the Gospels, uh, Matthew 24, Luke chapter 21, and also in Acts chapter 1, they asked him, you know, when are you coming back? And the Lord had already said that the day and hour he didn't know. But he emphasized all throughout the teaching in his own words directly to the disciples and through his revelation uh, to the Apostle Paul that we would know the times and seasons. We would know that. And so here we are looking at the revelation, which is the very end time program. And the question is, has the Father here in verse 1 revealed to the Son at this point the day and hour? Well, I don't know how far I would want to push this in terms of the language of the Bible, but my inclination would, just, would be to say no. He has not, still has not, Reveal to him the day and the hour. And the indication seems to be that the day and the hour is not going to be known by the sun until the day and the hour. And nowhere in the language of the book of the Revelation do you see anything that would indicate otherwise. But what you do have in this revelation to the churches from the Son is all kinds of information about the times and seasons. And the Holy Spirit is involved in helping us understand the times and the seasons. So let's go to Acts chapter 1 and we'll see this. Um, Acts chapter 1. Here, uh, Luke is <coughs> writing uh, Theophilus, his second long letter, Luke the physician, the one that traveled with the Apostle Paul to minister to his health needs. He's writing Theophilus here. By the way, Luke was not an apostle. He was... He was just a man. He was a physician. He was a Christian. I think it's very important to, to understand that because a lot of people think that if you're not a preacher, if you're not, you know, a person behind a pulpit all the time teaching, then um, what you have to say is, is maybe not going to be as important as the person that's the pastor or the whatever. But here was a man who wrote a letter. And God inspired him to write this letter. 
And here the Lord includes it, both of these letters, lengthy letters, into the canon of Scripture on a par with anything the apostles wrote. Now this should serve to encourage us because no matter what our station in life is, I'm telling you, Pastor Kelly used to say this all the time, you can witness to people out here in the public a lot better than I can because they expect me to be a certain way. But they don't expect a bricklayer to be somebody that knows the Bible up one side and down the other and sits down and teaches people and has a passion to see them get saved. Um, running into a plumber, running into a doctor that knows the Lord, like Luke, that has a passion to see souls saved is important. And I think that's one of the reasons the Lord puts people like Luke in here. Because these people did not hold a particular office in a church as though that's so important. What's important is you doing the will of God in the place that he has placed you in life. And so Luke is, is writing Theophilus here. And um, we're talking about that time period right after his, his resurrection, 40 days, you know, uh, would pass. And then on the 50th day, you have Pentecost, and the Lord is going to ascend back up into heaven. And so he's giving his last a few instructions to his disciples at this point before he ascends up. So let's look at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So here they had been journeying with him for quite some time and he had been teaching them that he was going to leave and that he was going to come back. And they didn't know what kind of time factor was involved in all of that. And so they're thinking within themselves now, okay, you, left, you, you were crucified, you, you were buried, and now you've come back from the dead. So is this the end of everything now? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? So this is how they were thinking. And notice what he says. And he said unto them, It is not, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now, what I was telling you earlier was that the thing that's important for us to know is not the day and hour, but the times and seasons. But right here, the Lord says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But you've got to read on because it gets good. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem and in Judea. And in Samaria. And unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so he's telling them. Okay right now you do not know the times and the seasons. That God has put in his own power. But you're going to know. And you're going to be given the power to know the times and the seasons at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes down upon you. And you're not going to know until then. And so with that, we go to 1 Thessalonians. 
And we'll see the evidence of that. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So Paul is, is using the same language here, and it's important for us to link these together. As a matter of fact, if I were you, I'd make a cross-reference right here in 1 Thessalonians 5 to Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. And I'd write that down there so that in the future you can link these two passages, because if you don't, you're going to miss something. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. There's something about the times and the seasons we're supposed to understand perfectly. Because the book is full of that information. The prophecy is an unfolding of the future so that we can study the future as it, as it unfolds and be strengthened in our faith in God that everything is happening exactly the way he said it was going to happen. And the Lord wants us to study these things, to study the times and the seasons. It's very important. He also says that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, a thief in the night is a, is a person uh, whose coming is, is, uh, is not going to be known. Uh, that's the key to being a thief is surprise, the element of surprise, the unknown. And so the thief, uh, he watches the house <laughs> He waits until that moment that no one is suspecting. And you don't know a thief. I mean, you're talking about a stranger. The, the thief wants to be unknown. The very opposite of Jesus Christ. He wants to be known. And so the, the concept of applying the thief to Jesus Christ <coughs> is not proper when it comes to the believer. And you're making a huge mistake if you give a teaching where Jesus Christ coming as a thief in the night, that that's the way it's going to be for the church. No, it's not. That is not the logic of the mind of God. That's not how he's using it. The church knows him. If you do not know him, you're not saved. You're none of his. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, to know Christ, to know his true identity, to know exactly who he is and what he's all about. Well, what do we learn about him when we learn about him? Well, he's not a thief. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness are of the world and they that dwell therein. What he, could he possibly be a thief of? Nothing, if you know him. He's the possessor of the heavens and the earth. He created them all. He's no thief, not in the mind of the believer. But I've heard many sermons preached on this where the slant is, okay, you better be careful because in the church, the Lord is coming as a thief. And the way they apply it is, um, we just don't know the day and the hour. And I'm saying that that's incorrect teaching. It's not the way that concept should be presented. It doesn't even apply to the church. It applies to the world of those that do not know him. And he's coming as a thief to the world of those that do not know him. But not to the church. And, and, and the Apostle Paul is separating and putting a, a distinction between the mindset of the world as compared to the believer in this, in this language here. He says those people are of the darkness. 
Look at verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. And so the thief term is consistent with the use of the word darkness. Darkness is a term that is used to describe the lost. We use this language in everyday speech. Oh, he's still in the dark. He doesn't know. That came right out of the Bible. But when we say, ah, the light, the light came on the other day and I understood. That's right out of the Bible. Those that are in darkness do not know. Those that are the children of light know. And we know the times and the seasons. That's the point of this passage. So in Revelation chapter 1, um, is this, at, is this some point here? Can we say that Jesus Christ at this point knows the day and the hour? I don't think so. I think we would strain the scriptures to say that he did. And why would he not? Why would he still choose not to know the day and the hour? I think in part because... He is conforming us to his image and he wants us to have the same kind of humility with the Father when it comes to knowledge as he has as we live awaiting his coming. We don't have to know the day and the hour. We just have to know he's coming. And he is, and every indication is it's going to be very, very soon. And the closer we study the times and the seasons, the better our knowledge is going to be concerning how soon. But it's going to be very soon. And there's no question about it. Now the life of the believer is Jesus Christ. And so the very life of Jesus Christ and what he is all about is our life. And if he doesn't know, neither do we. Now, in Revelation chapter 22, in verse 17, there's some interesting language there in connection with all of this, where it says, the spirit and the bride say come. The spirit and the bride say come. The spirit is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus Christ. And where does he dwell? He dwells in us. He dwells in us. And there's going to come a moment, there's going to come a day, there's going to come an hour, and the trumpet is going to sound, and the Spirit is going to say, the day and the hour has come, and we're going out of here. And I believe that's when we're going to know. And that's going to be very soon. So, in the way of a, a quick overview of some of the things we're going to be looking into in this study of the Revelation, we especially want to pay attention to verse 3, where it says, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear uh, the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So there's a there's a special blessing. I think it was Dr. Morris that, that made the point in his commentary uh, in the Defender's Bible that this is the only book in the Bible uh, where this special blessing is attached to 
a reading and a studying of it, a hearing of the words preached from this book. It's a special blessing. Oh, it's very special. Because it gives us the final thoughts of God, what is most important in his mind for the churches just before he comes. What should we be thinking about? And so we want this blessing. And, and very soon we're going to see him. And we want to be like him. We want to know him. We want to know all this information in advance of seeing him so that we're not embarrassed. We're supposed to be those that know Jesus Christ, that know him personally. Well, can we go out here and talk to people about what we know about him personally? That would help them. That would cause them to love him. I'm telling you, you can't know him without loving him. He's amazing. The Lord is an amazing person. We ought to be just fascinated with him. We ought, we ought to be fascinated with this book. We ought to read it with fascination because it's, listen, this isn't a philosophy book. This is the mind of God. And it's fascinating. How he thinks is fascinating. And we ought to be fascinated. And when we go out here and we witness to people, there ought to be something at least seen in us that would communicate the fact that he's the main thing in our life. There's nothing going on in our life that could be more important than this right here. So we need to be consumed with these things. That's not fanaticism. This is the most meaningful thing in the world. Is to know him. To know him. And to love him. The way the persons of the Trinity love one another. And commune and have this union together. And that's the way he wants us to be in our relationship with him. Um, this um, this revelation that we're given here is is complete. There's no not going to be a future revelation. This is the end of the message from heaven. And the thing that's so interesting is when you study the the messages to the churches. There's continual warning to every one of them, I think except maybe the church at Philadelphia, about false doctrine and false teaching. And those that say they're Jews and are not. People that are deceived about their relationship with God. People who think they're the people of God, but they're not. And so the final thoughts on the mind of God to the churches is the problem of deception and how you need to get the doctrine right. Now, we'll close with this thought. How can you logically do that? If God has not given us a message from heaven that's pure and preserved, and I submit to you, it's impossible. You got to have something that you can put your finger on. That human beings that are fallible in the mind can put their finger on and say, Thus saith the Lord, right here. And if you can't do that, you don't have a reference point. And you do not and you cannot know whether you're adding to or taking away from the message from heaven if he has not given us an inspired and preserved book. And he has. And that's why we use King James. Well, as you can see, our time is gone. So let's stop right here.
Sam, dismiss us, brother. Father, we are grateful to hear a teaching like this that helps us to understand 